Hi, this is Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us today for Live with Annie. As usual, we've started the stream a bit early to get everything set up and broadcasting properly to our various platforms. You can find a countdown clock on the screen showing how long it will be until we actually go live. While you wait, please connect with us and other viewers in the chat. Let us know where you are from and whether you are a new or longtime viewer. We'll see you live soon. again for joining us for Live with Annie. We are so happy to have you with us today. While you wait for the program to start, we hope you'll enjoy the content playing on screen. There's so much inspiration, so take a moment to tell us what you love in the chat. Don't forget there is a countdown clock on the screen so you know how long until we go live.
It's Annie again reminding you that we'll be going live with this week's episode shortly. There is a countdown clock on the screen showing how much time is left. You've got just enough time to grab some water or beverage of your choice and a snack and to connect with us in the chat. We'd love to hear what you've been working on this week. It's Annie back to remind you that we'll be starting this week's live very shortly. We've got a really fun episode planned for today, and we'll see you soon. I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for Episode 7 of Season 3 of Live with Annie. Today we are visiting with Prabjoth Menon of Harjis about her mission to bring silk fabrics to the U.S. and her efforts to support the artisans who produce these lovely natural fabrics. Prabjoth will share the story of how silk fabrics are made, along with tips for working with this lustrous fabric. We are so happy to see you all here today. Whether this is your first time watching Live with Annie, or you've seen all 107 episodes, we welcome you. We know there are so many things you could be doing with this time, and the fact that you've made time to join us really means a lot, so thank you. If you enjoy these episodes, please take a minute to follow us wherever you are watching us. 
And if you know someone who you think might enjoy the information that we share, we'd love it if you'd tell them about Live with Annie. The easiest way to do that is to just tag them while you're watching, as that will take them directly to the episode and they can watch it too. Don't forget, we love reading your comments, so please be sure to interact with us throughout this presentation. Tell us what you think about what we're showing, share your tips and tricks, and let us know the projects you are working on. Be sure to add any questions you might have in the comments or chat, and we will do our best to answer them before we close. Last week, we showcased our newly updated pattern Changing Station 2.0 and shared updates about our sixth annual local quilt shop contest, which is going strong. If you missed it or want to watch it again, remember that you can find all the previous 107 episodes of Live with Annie on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or at byannie.com, and we'll put up those links to make them easy for you to find. One note, we are having some problems with our website today, so if you may not be able to log in to byany.com or the live there, so hopefully you can find us on YouTube or Facebook. All right, I am really excited today to welcome a very special guest to Live with Annie. I met Prabhjoth Menon at the h and America show in Chicago last summer when she visited our booth and showed me a collection of lovely Dupioni silk fabrics that she had bought to the U.S. from India. Prabhjoth explained that she was working to develop a market to support the artisans who weave these lovely natural fabrics and to keep their traditions alive. I've invited Prabhjoth to share more about those efforts as well as the story of how silk fabrics are made and how to use these beautiful fabrics. So please help me welcome Prabhjoth. Hi, Annie. Hello. It's a it pleasure is, to be here. It is wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I was so intrigued by the stories and photos that you shared with me when we met in Chicago last June, and, and I talked to you then to see if you would come on and be a guest on live, so I'm really thrilled that you agreed to do that. Before we start with that, though, I would love if you would tell us all a little bit more about your background and the journey that you have taken to bring these beautiful fabrics to the U.S. Thank you. Um, yes, it was really nice to connect with you over the summer when we met um, at the H&H &H Americas. And, you know, you're such a warm person. And I think um, that connecting with people who have, uh, you know, similar values makes that interaction so much more valuable. And so it was very nice because we connected at that level. Um, about myself, well, um, I was born and raised in New Delhi, India. And, um, you know, I, I grew up there. I learned to sew from my mother um, and my aunts. Um, you know, every summer they would teach us um, embroidery, knitting, um, just small things. And, um, you know, we would do small projects. And it was just um, uh, a very informal thing, you know. And when I look back and think about those memories, uh, they just bring such a such a warm feeling, you know. Um, I lost my mother a few years ago, but you know. So when I go back to quilting, it's it's just very nice. It reminds me of that uh, phase of life. Um, anyway, I came to United States as a graduate student many years ago now, um, and uh, you know, um, I I decided to stay home to raise my kids. And now they're grown up, they're, you know, I'm an empty nester and um, I had some time for introspection. And I realized that I had missed this, the sewing part, the, you know, and, and I took up quilting and I had not done quilting before, uh, but I found it to be a very engaging, uh, uh, you know, outlet. And, and I met uh, a community of quilters who, like my aunts and sisters, you know, was a very welcoming and a very, um, a very warm um, and collaborative environment. Um, I taught, I, I learned from them every small thing, you know, piecing together flying geese and you know um, the different, the different aspects of quilting. 
And, um, and I did a, a mixed media project, an eclectic pro project um, with a, a, you know, a quilter from here who's now a, a good friend of mine. Um, and I made, I made this quilt that you see behind me. Uh, I made this quilt with her. And, um, and I started on this journey of quilting um, with mixed media. And so this quilt that you see is actually uh, by uh, Lynn Schmidt of a different box of crayons. It's her design. Um, you know, I went and bought the fabric from India. Um, and then, um, you know, that's how my journey began with quilting. And when I would talk to her, um, I realized that, that Dupioni silk especially, and other forms of silk, silks as well, that they were a, a, a very valuable fabric in quilting and, um, and home deck communities. And, and I also realized that the artisans who make this, uh, who weave this fabric, they are from very poor communities. Um, and right at that time is when COVID hit. And, you know, I was home and I had more time to quilt. And it also, um, that was the part where, you know, we saw um, all facets of humanity. We saw the good and the bad. And that period acted as a catalyst for me. Um, it made me think that, you know, um, if I want to do something, now is the time to do it. So even though uh, it might be something small, I felt that, you know, I should get started. And so my objective is to bring uh, the products directly from the weavers and uh, from the villages um, and the bazaars in India and uh, to bring them to the U.S. market um, and, and provide them a platform. The idea is to cut the middleman because the, the weavers are very poor people. Communities are, you know, they don't even have basic needs. There are some communities that are uh, like that. Um, and, and, and it's such an expensive um, fabric sold here, but the profit is not really going to the weavers. So, so that's my, um, you know, objective. We've just gotten started on this journey. We have a long way to go, but we have gotten started. That's, that's so wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that story because that really touched me and I'm really hopeful that we can help you um, help them uh, develop a market and get that out there. Thank you too for sharing some of your silk with me um, when we were there. I had really never worked with silk before, but it is absolutely a gorgeous fabric. It really adds a touch, touch of luxury to whatever you're doing. So um, when you came, you had showed me a few pictures and I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit more about the process that makes these beautiful fabrics. Sure, sure. So I'm happy to share what I have learned along the way. Um, it is a learning process for me. But, you know, so, so silk is basically this beautiful, lustrous fabric. It will add a touch of class to any project, large or small. Um, and um, it is, you know, silk is used in, in many different, uh, 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 you know, for wedding dresses, for upholstery, for quilting, in many crafts, in many venues, you know. Uh, but silk fiber, the, the fiber that is produced in nature, it is a, a, a natural protein fiber, and it is spun by the silkworms. I think most people know this, that, that you know, it, it comes from these silkworms. And, um, uh, and then it is spun by these, uh, into the fabric by these very experienced weavers um, and artisans. And many of these are, you know, from tribes in India. They're in, in the remote parts of India, and they are um, artisans and tribes that have honed this process that have perfected this the different steps on it in it um, it is a very labor intensive process and there are many steps involved so um, these artisans have a rich cultural background they have traditions and they have perfected this art of weaving um, so for, uh, in my understanding of the process i would divide it into three sections so the first section is called sericulture, which involves basically, um, you know, uh, the, the cocoons and the, and the natural fiber, dealing with that. Um, the second part 
is the reeling of this fiber into yarn. And then the third section is uh, taking this yarn and weaving it into, uh, into a fabric, the fabric that we use, uh, the product. And so, um, and in each of these stages, there are many different options. So there are many different products in silk. Uh, we, you know, loosely call mm, the silk fabric, but there are actually many different types of silk fabrics. And um, the basic difference is that the silkworm itself, um, there are different silkworms. So as you can see on the screen, um, you know, I received this from uh, the Silk Mark organization in India. You know, they are trying to promote uh, the, the silk weavers also. So these are the four different types of silkworms, uh, the mulberry, the tusser, the airy, and the muga. The left side shows you the cocoon that these silkworms make, and the right side shows you the yarn from, this, from these silkworms. So, so these silkworms, um, they feed on different types of leaves and hence produce different types of fiber. Um, this fiber is secreted by their salivary glands. Um, mulberry is the most common, uh, the most commercialized type, because the silkworm is fully, um, you know, domesticated. It's not in the wild. The tusser, and you see variation in the in the in the spelling. You will many times see it written as T U S T U S S A R, but it's the same, basically same thing. Um, so these the remaining three, the tusser, the airy, and the muga, um, these are referred to many times as wild silk. And they are um, wild in the sense that um, uh, they are not do easy to domesticate. And so they actually produce mm, a little bit of silk. Mulberry is the most, is the, is the majority of the silk that is produced. Um, the other three are less in, in quantity in, in circulation at any rate. Um, so, so all of these silkworms, um, like uh, some other insects, they go through four stages um, in their life. There is the egg, the larva, the pupa, and then the moth. So there are these four stages. And sometimes, you know, some of your viewers might have done this as a project. I did this with my little girl when she was little. You know, we had these butterflies and, and you watch the butterflies, you know, go through the stage and you eventually see the butterfly become an adult and then you then you release them. So they go through a similar stage, the egg, the larva, the pupa and the moth. So the second stage from the larva to the pupa, um, in the pupa stage, uh, that is the third stage, um, the silkworm, it spins the cocoon by secreting um, from its salivary glands the liquid raw silk. This liquid becomes a fiber as it comes into contact with air. And, um, and so this fiber, this natural fiber is the silk fiber, and it is made up of two proteins. A protein is a chemical compound, you know, a, a, a mo molecule. Um, and, and these two proteins are fibroin and sericin. And we can get into details about them, but, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because the sericin is a gummy substance and it covers the, the first protein, the fibroin, and it, the sericin has some fantastic properties. Um, and, um, for example, it is, um, it's a biocompatible protein. It's a material that can be used um, because of its properties. It is antibacterial. Silk actually also, um, you know, prevents UV from going through UV light. So it's a protection against ultraviolet light. Um, and in fact, sericin is also used as uh, by surgeons for sutures, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, but anyway, so those are all, you know, the properties of this, this fiber. Anyway, so once this fiber is, you know, produced in the form of the cocoon, then the second stage begins. The second stage is when we um, unwind this fiber from the cocoon and reel it into a yarn. Now, here there is an important distinction to make because you see the silkworm is living inside of the cocoon at this point. And if we let it... Um, reach maturity, the 
moth will exit the cocoon, but it will pierce it as it as it leaves. And if it pierces the cocoon, then when you unravel the fiber, it will not be a long thread. So many of the viewers don't realize that at the cocoon stage, um, the cocoons are boiled in 90 degrees, 98 degree water. And the silk moth is actually, silk worm is actually killed inside that, that cocoon. And if it is killed inside and then the fiber is unraveled, you get a long piece of, of this fiber. Sometimes it can be as long as one kilometer. One kilometer is a very long, you know, 2.2 kilometers is a mile. So it's almost half a mile long. Anyway, um, the um, other than the mulberry, the other three um, silkworms that I mentioned, the tassadari and the muga, the ones that grow in the wild, in those many times, the, the moth is able to exit the cocoon. And, um, and so when these tribals um, and artisans collect the cocoons from the wild, and that's why it's called the wild silk, they co collected from the wild, then they sort the cocoons. You know, some of them are grown domestically, but but not to the extent as mulberry. At any rate, then these cocoons are sorted for pierced or unpierced. The pierced will go towards pure silk production, um, and you get a different product from them. the The pierced ones. Um, when you unravel them, the pierced ones, when you unravel them, you're going to get shorter fibers. And so these, uh, when you're reeling them, you have to twist these fibers together and you make it that into a yarn. That, that process is the reeling process, you know? So um, if, in fact, if you watch on YouTube, if you get a chance, it's very interesting. You can see these many different cocoons, the fibers from them are being uh, reeled into one yarn, into one yarn. And so how many cocoons um, are being reeled into one yard determines the, the weight and the strength of the silk. Because, you know, you will find some silks are thick, are heavy, some are very fine, are very thin. So it's at this process, at this step of the process, that, um, that how many cocoons are being used to make that one, one yarn uh, determines the strength and the weight at any uh, rate so at this stage you know you have different options the unpierced cocoon gives you a long piece of, of of yarn the pierced cocoons give you shorter fibers those fibers are processed differently then comes the next stage of um, of reeling the fabric uh, multiple there are multiple stages there after the reeling they will then um then combine these different yarns, make it one ply or two ply. They will twist the yarns together. This is still the reeling process. And then they will wind them on bobbins. They will bind, uh, wind them on these bobbins. And then these are uh, rolled into large bundles. These bundles are then processed. And at this stage, um, you know, how much processing takes place how much sedicin is washed away, uh, how much is retained, again, that defines the weight and the strength of the, of the fabric that we, that we will achieve. Um, the dyeing process takes place uh, before that, the bleaching. And different silks have different processes uh, you know, that are, at this point, perfected, uh, but they differ from each other slightly. But the basic, the method is the same. Once they are you know, dyed and washed and then dried. After that, they are then, um, you know, uh, uh, wound into smaller bobbins, which will um, go into the shuttle of this loom, that the, the hand loom that the weaver is going to use. Um, and, um, you know, so this uh, video that, that you are able to see, I hope, this is showing the reeling process. From this large bundle that has been processed, it is now being uh, uh, wound into smaller bobbins, which will be used by the weaver. Okay, so you see this rack behind. These are the smaller uh, bobbins that it is being reeled into. 
and uh, and you know um, so the so the fabric will be woven by the weaver um, there is the warp and there is the weft the two threads the longitudinal thread the long part of the fabric that um, is processed differently and the weft is processed differently and uh, uh, you know sometimes in dupioni silk especially you will see a sheen there is a two tone uh, uh, a color to the fabric it comes from the two different colors of the warp and the weft many times you see the same you know fiber or same thread rather along the the warp and the weft so there are variations that come in from this from this process at any rate um so these uh, rollers are converted into bobbins they will go inside the shuttles um for use as wefts and and in the next video um you will see that this weft is the the horizontal or the the width of the fabric you know when we buy the fabric you we specify 44 inch or 47 inch you see the weaver you see the weaver here this is actually i'm i'm going to talk about the weaver for a moment because we are working with uh, uh, this weaver his name is raj kumar das uh, he is a weaver from the state of jharkhand and the fabric that you are watching him weave in this video we currently stock that fabric and so you see with his hands he is controlling the the weft and although you cannot see very clearly here but with his feet he is controlling the warp the long part of the of the fabric um so so the long part of of the fabric which is now our what we are calling our warp um it's 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 the uh, uh, threads that are going up and down so he, with the pedals he you can see it right now the half half of them go up half of them go down once you have one set going up the weft goes through then the other part goes up and the weft goes the other way around and that's the process of weaving and and so in this you can as you can see that the longitudinal the warp it is held stationary with tension on the frame of the loom and this is con controlled by the pedals that raise every other warp thread weft thread is along the width and the shuttle is drawn through by hand through by hand and it is inserted under and over the warp so the weaver is using both hands and feet you can also see the conditions you can also see the conditions under which they work um this is actually a relatively clean place where he's working um it's uh, you know a warehouse uh but anyway um so so you know i was going to say that the width of the fabric um is determined by the loom and so you know there is no standardization for this silk you will generally see that it's either in 42 inch 44 inch 46 or the wider which is 54 inches but these hand looms have been handed down uh, from generation to generation so there is no standardization it depends on the weaver you know, what size loom he has and so for example our fa uh, fabrics that we stock they are many different lengths because depending upon uh, the the size of the loom so in general you know uh, this is the 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 three step process but like i said there are many nuances to it um at at each stage wow that was so fascinating to to see all of that happening what a laborious project process that is too i was really surprised and that is really interesting to hear you know that the the looms have been around for generations probably and so uh, i can see why there wouldn't be a standard in there but um we just you gave me some gorgeous fabrics i'm sorry i haven't sewn very much with it but i did manage to do a couple of our snapshot bags using this these pieces of dupioni silk now are dupioni silks made with the mulberry is that or not always it is not always but mostly yes because just because that is the most um commercial um silkworm available that can be domesticated the Got others it. are there is but it's the market is very small 
Yeah, okay. And then this piece that you gave me is um, has a more coarse, nubby texture. So can you tell us a little bit about those different types and what makes those different? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so the basic difference is the silkworm itself, what they eat. Um, and um, so, for example, the mulberry eats the mulberry leaves. Um, and the, the other ones, uh, the tusser, the airy, and the muga, they are uh, grown in the wild. So they eat the vegetation that grows in different parts of the country. Uh, and I'm referring to India, you know, um, because that's where these fi fabrics are coming from. And so depending upon the region of the country, for example, muga silk comes from a state of Assam. And tusser silk, comes from Bihar, West Bengal, Odisha, and Madhya Pradesh, also Jharkhand. Mulberry is grown in India in the southern part. Mulberry also comes from China. There's a very big production in, in China. But in India, it comes from Tamil Nadu and Karnataka and Telangana. The reason for this uh, nubbiness that you were mentioning it comes uh, from, you know, when I was uh, mentioning about reeling the fiber and if when you have the smaller fibers, when you twist them together, um, that's what brings in the nubbiness. Um, also, with this irregularity, which actually gives the beauty to this fabric, provides the texture to this fabric, um, also um, comes from the, uh, because of that, we have to weave it by the hand loom, on the hand loom. On a machine, um, you know, there are uh, silks that are produced by machines, uh, but this type of fabric cannot be because the loom will stop, because there will be knots that will appear. So there is a, cert a, a great degree of skill that is involved when these, uh, you know, this particular fiber uh, is converted to the yarn and, and is, is woven. The also the um, you mentioned the sheen. The sheen comes from um, this um, protein that I had mentioned earlier, the sericin. Sericin is a, a, I mentioned already is a fundamentally you know a, a beautiful uh, compound. It's a protein. It turns out that the silk fiber, if you analyze it, you know, and there's and lots of research in textile chemistry has been done on it. Um, if you take the cross section of this fiber, they find under the scanning electron microscope, they find that this fiber has uh, three faces. It's like a three triangular faces. And these corners, um, are, it, it is secreted like that by the salivary glands. So nature makes it like that in that um, you know, morphology. So because of those facets, the triangular three faces and the corners are not pinpoint, they are, you know, wedges. Uh, because of that, the light, the way it reflects and refracts from these surfaces gives it that sheen. So if you wash away the sericin, you are going to alter this morphology and you will not have the same type of sheen uh, from this fabric anymore, that luxurious, you know, the lustrous, uh, almost almost that iridescent uh, feel that you get. Um, and it is similar also, you know, you may have heard, you may know, um, even cotton, cotton fiber is not, does not have the same uh, cross section, uh, you know, and there is a process called mercerization by which the cotton thread is treated with, with um, certain proteins and made shiny. And it's made shiny by changing its morphology. But anyway, I'm going off on a limb here. Well, that was really interesting. Uh, I had no idea that that's what mercerization meant. But interestingly, when I used to do shows with superior threads, they have a thread called, um, one called rainbows and one called highlights. And those are polyester threads but they developed them because of what they knew about silk and its triangular shape. And so when they make those threads, they take the polyester and extrude it through a, like a shower head. And instead of having round holes, they made triangular holes so that when that thread is woven, it has those sides that reflect the light. 
So How that was really fascinating to learn that. Yeah, so I they copied. Know that. Yeah, they copied <laughs> the silkworms. <laughs> so then I know that these must be dyed, but is this then on the tusser silk, is this a natural color on it? Okay, yes, uh, that's right. This is what you are just holding up. That is the natural color of tusser silk. Uh, you have one in your hand, yes, and I have one here too, which I wanted to show. It's right here. It's the it's same so beautiful. fabric. I love it too. I do. Um, this one, actually, if you can see, this fabric is the same one that you're holding, but this is slightly darker shade. Um, this is what you saw in the video, Raj Kumar Das is actually weaving this particular uh, fabric that, that he sent it to me then. And uh, you are correct. This is the natural color of the fiber. It has not been dyed. It has been processed, but only very slightly. Um, and so the weight of it, you, will, you can tell the more sericin that is still present, the thicker uh, and the stiffer the fabric will be. Um, the other thing that I wanted to... Um, say about this tusser fabric is that it does have a, a much more um, texture to it because of this this fiber um, and it is very well suited for quilting for uh, drapery use um, and other home de uh, fabrics it's not as slippery you know uh, pure silk um, and and other you know uh, man-made silks um, have more of a, of a slippery kind of a texture. This has more nubby feeling. It has a, a, a greater texture that can be used, uh, can be used very beautifully for uh, quilts, especially piecing together. And uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite. On my mic is off. Oh. All right, I think he, I think he's got me turned back on again. All right, so um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit too about what happens once the artisans weave these. I know that you have um, gotten involved with one of the organizations. Can you give us a little bit of more information about that and and what your process is for that? Sure, sure. So my, as my understanding of this process is, and you know. Uh, as I was telling you earlier, I grew up in India. We grew up around silk all all over the place, and we took it for granted. You know, every um, aspect of life, whether it was a religious ceremony, whether it's a wedding, whether you know any part of it, silk was always you know part of it. The the a bride's trousseau, for example, we call it dowry, um, would always include silk saris. You know, sometimes in, in depending upon, you know, how rich the family is, sometimes it would just be the bride who would wear a silk sari. And sometimes everybody has these, you know, uh, lovely, beautiful silk saris. And there's a huge market in India for silk saris. And there are special weavers who make, who specialize in making silk saris. Um, but anyway, um, it is my understanding that these weavers um, are, you know, using these handlooms, they either work for a big corporation uh, for a very meager wage. They make very little money because they work for these uh, uh, big corporations or they are these traditionally owned businesses that have been there for generations and um, they sell their product to a local market that sells it, you know, to a bigger market and to a, a, may, maybe a... a you know, design shop or a fabric shop, uh, but the the artisan themselves make very little money because there are many steps before it gets to um, a, a, a dressmaker or, a, a, you know, a big store. The big stores sell their products at a very high cost uh, because there are limited number of weavers um, and with the you know, the payback is not that much. So the younger generation is not getting involved into it that much. It's a laborious process, as you saw, very labor intensive. And the rewards are not uh, that high, especially for the young people. Now, uh, certain 
government entities are working toward it, are making things better. And one of uh, our partners is uh, an organization called JARCraft. Jharkraft is a state-run organization from the state of Jharkhand. And what you're seeing on the screen is one of their centers. These weavers, they are, uh, you know, being supported by Jharkraft. And um, they provide um, for the women, for women empowerment, they provide them with sericulture, uh, things that they need. For example, the cocoons and, the, you know, all the infrastructure that you need to go get the cocoons from the wild or, or, or to for reeling. Here they are sitting in a marketplace, they are selling. This is another uh, person who's reeling from that large bundle into bobbins. You can see the bobbins sitting on the floor next to him. And so Jharkraft is uh, uh, you know, supporting these. This is a weaver who's weaving the yarn um, into, into fabric. So Jharkraft is one of the organizations, our, one of our partners. Uh, their fabric is, um, you know, certified by the Silk Board of India. And you get that guarantee that it is pure silk. Um, from them, their uh, products are also organically certified by, um, I think their certification has just run out. Uh, I think an organization in United States has uh, approved um, uh, and given them that certificate of organic, uh, you know, silk. Um, so they provide um, training and equipment, um, and then they also have centers where they sell their product. So it's not just giving them the tools to make this, but they also provide a market for them. So we will, uh, we are working with Jharkraft uh, for some of the products, um, and uh, I'm also learning from them because uh, you know it's it's quite a complicated process, and there are so many nuances to it. Um, but but we are very happy uh, that we are able to partner with Jharkraft. And these yeah. all these um, the pictures that you saw were provided by them. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's that's really wonderful. And boy, what an education you're getting, and what an education you're sharing with us too. So thank you so much for getting involved with that. And I'm sure those people are are really appreciative of what you're doing to help promote them. So thank you. I was hoping that um, you could also show us, we have made a couple of projects that we'll talk about in a little while, but I know that you've made some beautiful projects too using the silk. So I thought maybe we could share some of those and then also talk about some tips for working with silk because it's not exactly like cotton I've learned. Sure, I'm happy to share uh, my projects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is my, um, actually this was my first quilt that I started, but second to finish, because it took me a while to finish it. It has some beautiful Dupioni silk, you can see um, different, different, uh, at different spots, but this also has cotton, so it's a mixed media project. So this was my uh, first uh, uh, quilt that I made. The design is by Lynn Schmidt. Uh, who's a friend of mine, a lovely lady. She is so talented. Um, if you get a chance, uh, please visit her website. Um, her store is in Glen Ellen. It's called A Different Box of Crayons. And my gosh, she is creative. Uh, and uh, I love her projects. I've made a few uh, with her. I've learned from her. And she also is a supporter of our endeavor. So that's, that was one of my projects. Uh, then when I met you, I started with some of the projects, uh, are your patterns, Annie, and I was so um, happy and, and so impressed with the way your um, patterns are written. They are very elaborate and just very well written. I enjoyed making them. This one that I'm holding up in my hand is called uh, Travel Essentials, Travel Essentials 2.0 actually. And I made this with, um, you can see some of the, the fabrics here. I have used some calf facet in this. I have used some batiks. I have just pieced them together. And um, the strap is made with this our, uh, blue fabric that we carry. It's called Beacon Blue. And um, I just made, loved making this project. I, this is probably one of my favorite bags. Um, and I intend to use this. So many of my family members have asked for it. 
We'll see who gets to use it for now. I'm just saving it. But I love it. So this is, you know, uh, our first project with your patterns. All right. The second one that I made um, was, this one is called Open Wide 2.0. And open wide 2.0 uh, also, uh, this is an easy uh, pattern, I thought. And I enjoyed making this also. Here I used a, just a plain cotton fabric that I had, but I embellished it with just a little bit of Jupioni. And many times I find little bit makes it uh, look even more beautiful. Sometimes too much gets a little too glittery, you know, um, depends on your project. Uh, for this one, I just used a small strip and I did a little bit of embroidery on it because, you know, um, I wanted to, I, I like to do embroidery sometimes, and this is machine embroidery, and I just wanted to show this and share with your viewers that Dupioni silk holds very well with, with, with machine embroidery. You can embroider on it very nicely. It, it comes up very beautifully. Um, you know, you use uh, uh, the the products, uh, um, an interfacing or, a, um, you know, things like that you have to use for it, but it comes out very beautifully. The next one that I want to show you is the same green fabric that I showed you on the, on the Open White 2.0. This one is my Catch All Caddy 2.0, and I love it. I just, I made two of them. The second one is in my car. I it never leaves my car. Uh, it is such a nice way to keep things organized. And here again, I used a little bit of embroidery. I'm using the Peter Rabbit uh, theme here. Um, and I just loved it. This fabric, the green, light green, almost, you know, it's a beautiful pastel, beautiful for, um, you know, Easter time. You know, it brings uh, memories and, and thoughts of, uh, springtime for me. Um, this one is called Spruce Stone. The, the name of this fabric you will find. Um, and, and perhaps I should mention here that on Etsy, when you on our uh, storefront, when you search for fabrics, um, they are listed by their color. This one is under light green. But you know, as with fabrics um, in general, and with Dupioni in particular, um, the the relationship of the light and the color is 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 very uh, you know tricky. It can be tricky. Um, some of the fabrics they look different in different lights. So to minimize discrepancy, there you go. That's the uh, that's the spruce stone fabric. To minimize uh, the discrepancy in the in the you know, color and uh, of the of the fabric, we have uh, given it a Pantone number. What you see on the left bottom corner, 19-63160 CX. That's a Pantone number for this fabric, for this color. And it's given the name Spruce Stone. You can search for this online. You can do a Google search and you will see what this color looks like. Pantone colors were, you know, developed by designers when they're talking about color they want to be sure which which one are they talking about so we are using that and very soon on our etsy site with each fabric you will see a picture of that pantone color we're doing that just to minimize the confusion the discrepancy this next one our fabric dune this is what annie was showing you um the the light tusser silk it's Pantone color, 17-1009 TCX. Uh, it's also a very beautiful textured fabric, as you can see. So now I wanted to show you the next project. Uh, I have this one. This one is made with red silk fabric, Dupioni. It's called Emboldened. And I did some hand embroidery on this one. This is this pattern is also by Lynn. Um, her pattern it's called Snowflake, um, and she teaches in that how to do this. We make these snowflakes. They are so beautiful. I don't know That's if you gorgeous. can see the yeah. The thank you. The threads 
are shiny they have a luster there are some red ones i've used some gray and some white and some silver i i was traveling over the holidays and i could take this with me and i could work on it while traveling it was small um you know small project that i could bring along and this particular fabric on our site we have a video of this fabric and you know you will see me rotating this fabric um and the color um changes as the angle of the light changes and you know it's it's really fascinating to see that um this is the one thank you thank you for showing this video can you tell how the you know for sure that's gorgeous thank you yeah it's a beautiful fabric i love it wow so you know we try to uh, put videos and because it's difficult to know the exact color it depends on the lighting a lot so those were some of the projects that i did and um i have one more but i want to see what did you make with 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 the with the fabric that you took you mentioned to me um and you have this pattern that i am so looking forward to the snapshot Yes. I I think when you gave me the fabrics we were planning this project and as soon as I saw them I thought oh that is going to be perfect. So this is our new pattern called Snapshot which includes instructions for bags in two sizes that to me are just perfect for a wedding or a prom or a night on the town and we use the silk for the outside and then on the inside we just used a cotton fabric um, with some um, interfacing fused. And so we made it just like the pattern directs, but the beautiful sheen, the nice textures in it. The other thing that you had mentioned on your travel essentials that you did the silk for the handle, I was really impressed with how fine and soft the fabric is when you use it on a handle. So this one we did just like the pattern directs with the um, with the strapping inside it, but when we did our wristlet strap that's made from our free pattern, we used just a little interfacing, but it's just really soft and comfortable and, and really nice um, to carry it. One thing that I wanted to bring up is that when we were um, pressing these and, and fusing them to the interfacing, we did notice a little bit of shrinkage. And when I mentioned it to you, you shared that the heat settings are really important when you're working with silk because it has a really low threshold threshold for heat. So I was hoping you could share some tips for working with it because um, we weren't aware of that when we started and we should have been. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, so you know, in my experience um, uh, working with Dupioni Silk, um, I find that the heat settings are very important. They're crucial, in fact, uh, because this fiber has a very low threshold for heat. So we have to be careful, use low setting for heat, it helps. And also, it's better to um, press the fabric from the back. Uh, and I would also recommend to test it on a small area first uh, to to optimize to find the optimum setting for the heat for in your for your iron. Um, now this fabric does not have a front or a back. It looks the same. So you decide which is your you know which side you prefer. But they are identical actually. Um, the second thing that helps is to stabilize the fabric and. Um, I always work with uh, with with uh, any lightweight interfacing. Maybe Pellon lightweight works very well, as well as there's a product called uh, Touch of Gold. I have used both of them, and um, you know they both work equally fine uh, in my experience. Um, there is uh, in you get it in white or you get it in black, so you can use it with light colors or dark colors. Um, but uh, I find, especially for piecing, you know, it's very important to to um, stabilize it using an interfacing. I apply the interfacing before I cut the fabric. I also uh, apply it with medium heat setting before the fabric is cut, like I said. Um, I do use a pressing cloth for it and a light water spray, not too much, very little, light water spray. 
Um, and I use blotting motion of the iron. I don't slide. I, I, I would recommend avoid sliding the iron on the fabric. Um, having said that, you know, when I was making um, the, the patterns that I showed, um, like the travel essentials, um, I used soft and stable. And I think you can get away without using a stabilizer on soft and stable because it's it, it already has you know that ability to stabilize the fa fabric, um, and you might be able to get away without using touch of gold. Uh, but for these projects, I actually searched around the pieces um, on all edges, and then I piece them together just because I was not so confident, uh, you know. Uh, about the project, but I think that was a bit of an overkill. You really don't need to do that, but it didn't hurt, so I, I did that. Also, I want to show you um, and your viewers that when you purchase Dupioni silk from us, from Harjis, you will get this fabric care uh, uh, sheet. This lists exactly what I mentioned. It tells you, you know, uh, about the heat setting, about the interfacing, um, and um, I would also say that um, I mentioned earlier, and I want to repeat that the sericin, which gives it that luster, if you wash this fabric, you know, that luster will go away. So it is recommended that you use it for projects that are only going to be dry cleaned. These projects are not your, you know, uh, everyday use. It's, it's not something that you will have rough use for. These are your special projects, um, something that you, you know, you will value. You put in a lot of effort into it. And, um, you know, so, so it is recommended that you dry clean them because once you wash it, then the silk will become dull. It's a really good tip and a really good suggestion. So, um, yeah, go down a little bit, Glow, because I had another question that was on there. No, the other way. So not to wash it because that changes and only dry clean it. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Go down a little bit further because there was another question that I had. Um, oh, as far as cutting, and you mentioned that a little bit when you were talking about surging. Um, because the one thing that we noticed when we were cutting is that we really wanted to make sure we had a really sharp blade in our rotary cutter because the something about the fibers is very different from cotton fibers and it would just push them right down into the mat and if we tried to lift it up then we would get a lot of frain but if we had a really sharp cutter we didn't have that problem so have have you noticed that as well that's a very good point that is correct i have so I always start a new project with a new blade. Um, and I think you, just like you mentioned, that when you cut it, that if, if it's not too sharp, uh, you will push too hard on it and it will go into the mat and that uh, will make the, fab the fiber unravel. Because remember, this is most of this is done by the hand loom and it depends on the weave, but nevertheless, no matter what type of weave is being used, it will unravel. So two things that help, one is using a sharp rotary cutter, using, uh, and the second thing is the interfacing that I mentioned already, that will help with fraying. Um, yeah, I never thought about interfacing it before I cut. So that was really a good tip is just go ahead and interface that whole piece and then cut from that. And you will find that that will make a big difference. When you start to sew, do you have do you sew with silk thread or do you use other types of thread? Um, I don't use silk thread to piece the silk pieces together. I okay. use a forty weight uh, with um, uh, I use um, uh, I believe it's an eighty or a ninety size needle. I wanted to make sure, so I was looking at my notes. Um, I use an eighty or a ninety size needle and a forty weight uh, thread. Uh, uh, with some polyester in it. I don't use pure cotton thread and I do not use silk. Uh, for top stitch, I have used silk thread, the embroidery thread, and that looks very beautiful also. But for piecing, I would use a 40 weight polyester blend. Okay. I know that we, everything that we did, we used a um, 9014 top stitch needle and then we used a 50 weight 
polyester thread. So we, we pretty much always work with Superior's Sofine number 50, and that worked really well too. So um, I think a sharp needle and a sharp blade are probably uh, the biggest tips that I had to share. What about stitch length? Do you do just a regular stitch length or do you shorten or lengthen that somewhat? Um, I would recommend the, a shorter stitch length. I use a 2.5, 2.0, you know, that st stitch length works just fine for me. Okay. And, but I and do recommend, I think shorter stitch length will help. When you do the quilting, do you still use a shorter stitch length? Yes. Like that quilt behind you when it, did you uh, machine quilt that? Well, actually it is machine quilted, but I didn't do it. A friend okay. of mine did it. And okay. um, I think the, from when I, as I look at it, it's not a very short stitch length. I would say for the quilting, maybe medium, medium okay. length. Is, is so good. maybe like a 3.0 yeah. to 3.5, like just like cotton probably. Yeah, I sounds so. good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all of those tips and for showing us all your lovely projects. I am looking forward to making another project. I thought I'd get a set of clam ups uh, made before we met today and it just didn't happen. But your um, ones that were made with the piecing and I love the idea of combining the, um, the the batiks in with it, I can't wait to play with some of those. So you gave me some really good ideas. If customers want to get some of your silk projects for their projects, where do they find them? And, and tell us about that beautiful snapshot that you're holding up too. That is lovely in the, is it black? Yes, mm -hmm. uh, I, I wanted to share this and I think I should have worn a different colored shirt today, but um, this is, uh, our fabric jet set. It's black, dupioni silk, and I loved making this. I'm going to use this. I wanted to make it in a color that I can use, and black goes with everything, especially because I have dark hair. So I feel, if nothing else, it always matches, uh, and I love this, this fabric. You will see it has a nice sheen to it. Um, I, you know, it's a good size and I loved making it. You will find this on our Etsy store. It's called Jet Set, um, and it, it's basically pure black silk. Um, I found this paired with the yellow, the Inca gold that we have. I think I'm going to make a Halloween project with those uh -huh. two and some of the other colors. I think they go very well together. And yeah, that, that's our, our uh, jet set, the, the black dupioni silk. It's a hundred weight um, dupioni silk fabric. And I think it's 44 inches wide. Um, it's one of our newer fabrics that we have, uh, uh, you know, recently gotten. Can um, you explain the, what the hundred weight means? Is that a heavier uh, yeah. than the normal? there are there is a variation we have some that are 80 gsm um they are uh the gsm stands for grams per square meter and okay. it it comes so so the the different varieties uh, that you get are in terms of the weight and the strength of the of the yarn with which the fabric is woven and it basically comes from the fact that how many cocoons uh, the threads were twisted together to make that one thread and then how many threads were twisted together to you know uh to provide that strength for the fabric got it and yes the heavier it is the more expensive it'll be that makes perfect sense so is there a range that you would recommend like 80 to 100 for most projects like this or i, I don't think you will see that variation because most uh, uh sellers will not mention that okay okay Got but it. but as as you get more and more into the fabric you realize that the quality of the fabric you know those are the nuances those are the things that make them different also the weave patterns you know these weavers have they've got their act together they have an arsenal of different types of weaves that they use which produces a different type of fabric wow Wow, yeah, what an education and what something to look for now as I look at silk fabrics. I'll look at them in a whole different light. I know that you had said you wanted to offer a, a special 
to our uh, viewers today. So I wonder if you could tell them about that. Yes. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And I wanted to share with your viewers that if you go on our um, uh, you know, Etsy uh, shop, um, we are offering a 5% off discount of your total purchase for the month of February. Uh, the discount code that you should use is Annie for Weavers. You see it on your uh, uh, screens right now. So please make a note. We are just, we are just, uh, uh, you know, releasing this discount offer, um, and uh, it will run through the end of February. So please put your orders in now and make make use of this five percent off discount. We are so happy that um, Annie, you are supporting our, uh, you know, this endeavor uh, to support the weavers of India and and. I know, I'm sure that you, the, the quilters, the crafters, I know this community, they always stand together and help out. Um, you know, when I started this Hergis, it was created in memory of my parents. And they taught us that you have to look beyond yourself. You know, and I know from the quilters that this is that community. Um, and so I'm very excited and I look forward to working with you, with, um, you know, uh, your viewers. Uh, we look forward to getting their orders. And um, I think that's it. I think I've said, covered uh, it all. I hope I haven't missed anything. I think you did. And um, I, I wanted to see if there was any questions from people. I see a note here that says, lots of comments about how fascinating it was to see the process of making the silk fabrics um, and can we do more shows focusing on the production of materials so yes we will certainly try to do that one question asked was do domestic moths or other bugs eat silk fabrics i know like yeah you have to worry about wool sometimes with moths getting in there is silk affected that way um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, yes, they will get affected, although I have never seen that in the United States because we live in very climate controlled environments, you know, most places. Uh, but yes, growing up in India, yes, I have seen it get damaged. Um, but I don't remember what insects do that. Uh, but in general, I think it's a good idea to keep it away from sun and rot, you know, keep it in a dry place. Um, and keep it away from the sun. Huh. Yeah, that was interesting. But it was especially interesting when you said that it has a natural UV protection, which my thought was, oh, it would be great to make a shirt to go out in the sun, but not so much if you... <laughs> so I guess just know that it may not last as long. So that was really interesting. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for joining us today. It was really a pleasure to talk with you, to see all the beautiful projects that you made. We really appreciate your efforts to improve the quality of life for all those artisans who make these beautiful fabrics and keep their traditions alive. And I hope that when we are in Chicago this June for the H&H &H show that I'll see you there. Are you planning to go? Yes, yes, I will see you there. And thank you so much for having me on your show today. You are welcome. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again. Bye. Wow, that was such an inter interesting process to watch, wasn't it? And it really, like I said, gave me a new appreciation for silk fabric and a desire to use them in some projects. So we hope that if you make something with silk, you will be sure and post pictures. We love seeing what you make. Um, be sure to enter them in our photo contest. I know Prabhjoth would enjoy seeing them too. So I want to move on to just a couple of quick announcements before we close. Um, don't forget that next Monday night, which is February 27th, I am going to be a guest on So Tell Me with Joanne Banco. Um, we are going to be talking about all things by Annie, how I got started in this business, what's coming up. Uh, so please be sure to join us. It's going to be a really fun and informative and very casual evening. So you'll find all of Joanne's videos at, at Let's Go Sew with Joanne Banco on YouTube. And be sure to give her a follow and add the event to your calendar and, and join us on Monday night. Also, last week we told you about a number of vendors who will be at Sew Expo in Puyallup, Washington. 
with our products. So if you're going to that show and want to see some Biani models up close and personal and buy some Biani products, be sure to visit with them. So we talked more about what each booth will have in last week's episode, but we thought we'd just put up the list today. If you missed that, um, you can jot down those numbers. If you want to hear more about any of those companies, um, be sure to watch last week's episode towards the end. Also, as a reminder, our sixth annual local quilt shop contest is still going strong. It has been so much fun to watch the votes come in over the past few weeks, and we really thank you all for the support that you have shown to local quilt shops already. There are only a few days left in the contest, but as of 10 a.m. this morning, we had received 27,556 votes for 1,731 stores in 11 countries. So voting closes on Monday, which is February 28th, so there is less than a week left to vote. So be sure to go on and check to see how your favorite uh, local quilt shop is doing, because even if they're not currently in the top levels, it is definitely not too late for them to win a prize. We have definitely seen some movement among the top shops recently. I noticed that two and three are different than they were just the last time I looked. And if you want your store to win a Biani trunk show and all of the other fun prizes, be sure to take a look at the leaderboards on the LQSContest.com website. As I scrolled through them this morning, I noticed that there are some really tight races in a number of places. In Arizona, there is a tie for first place. So if you're in Arizona or you have a favorite shop in Arizona, uh, be sure and check that out and, and help them, um, one of them, move into first place. So if you haven't already voted, be sure to do that soon. If you have, remind your family, your friends, your sewing buddies, your neighbors, all of them to vote too. Not only do shop owners get to really enjoy reading the customers or the comments that their customers make, but thanks to our amazing sponsors, they are all also competing for some really awesome prizes. And if you go to our dedicated website, which is lqscontest.com, you'll find all the details about the prizes, the ability to vote, and you'll be able to see how your favorite shops are faring in the contest. All right, before we close, we have a featured local quilt shop that we want to tell you about today. This is something that we do each week throughout the year. Um, we try to support the local quilt shops not only through the contest but by talking about them throughout the year and sharing some of the comments that customers made when they voted th um, for them in the contest. So this week we are traveling to Hemingford, Nebraska to visit Pat's Creative and they are celebrating 48 years in business this year. So the store was opened in 1975 by Pat Buskirk Sonia Buskirk and Sh by Pat Buskirk. Okay, so Sonia Buskirk and Shelley Blow are the second and third generations who are now running the show, and the fourth generation is also loving sewing too. So Sonia and Shelley are a mother daughter team, and they are most definitely fabric connoisseurs. So the store started with garment fabrics and construction, but in the 1990s, they changed their passion to quilting. They carry over 5,000 bolts of quilting cottons, cuddles, flannels, and then threads, notions, books, patterns, and lots more. So basically, they say they have everything a stitcher needs. They're located in the heart of the Nebraska Panhandle on their family farm, which is seven miles outside of Hemingford. Board. And the store serves a really large rural area with customers coming from 100 miles away in every direction. The local one-stop sewing shop, Pat's Creative, is also a certified dealer for Bernina, Janome, Handy Quilter, and AccuQuilt. So in addition to Sonia and Shelley, the staff includes two awesome team members, Jane and Carol, and all of them teach and pitch in to help customers and take care of all the tasks in a busy shop. Customers who voted for Pat's Creative in this year's contest praised the store's customer service and helpful staff. Sheila wrote, they have the best customer service imaginable, as well as a huge selection of fabrics, notions, and machines. And I had to laugh at Linda's story that explained what happened when she visited the store for a spool of thread. I had to buy a sewing machine to go with the spool of thread. And then I had to learn how to sew in order to use the machine, and they were so helpful. 
I'm sure that there are a lot of us who can relate to that story. We get um, so excited and pretty soon we're off on a whole new adventure. So that was fun to read. All right, Pat's Creative is going to have their Biani Trunk Show on display in the store until March 8th. So be sure to get in soon to check that out and be sure to tell them that Annie sent you. Thank you again to everyone who joined us today. We are going to be back next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time with an extra fun episode of Live with Annie, during which we are going to introduce a brand new by Annie product, by Annie's double-sided basting tape. Um, this extra sticky narrow tape is perfect for all cuts, all sorts of sewing and crafting, and you are going to really love learning more about it. So until then, happy stitching!